morning. Um, I want to talk today about uh, an idea of uh, ideas about change and offer a perspective on uh, rapid change or acceleration um, to uh, alternative futures, not all of which are benign. Uh, why, when there's so much evidence around so many activities undertaken, uh, movements founded and so on, uh, are we still not uh, approaching sustainability as rapidly as most of us think we should? Um, the usual reasons given for, uh, for this, um, which have uh, certainly some merit, are the power of vested interests, resistance to change, and ignorance about the true state of affairs. This idea, if only everybody understood, they would act appropriately. Um, without uh, suggesting that these aren't real things, those uh, usual reasons, I want to propose three somewhat different ways of thinking about the question of uh, how uh, we uh, might quickly achieve a, a more sustainable world, uh, and then end with a few thoughts about uh, perhaps a, a deeper issue. I want to start with the question of change itself and how change happens. I'm going to be building a little bit off um, James uh, Meadowcroft's comment uh, uh, yesterday, Joachim's number six, uh, the uh, other transitions, uh, and I think there's some connection actually to the two preceding presentations as well. So a common way of representing the problem we have is this concept of a gap, right? There's what will happen if we don't do anything, and then there, where we want to be, and in between is a gap. This is, you can, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of reports out there that talk about the emissions gap or the sustainability gap. Uh, and they all proceed on the basis of uh, a baseline. The agenda, the standard agenda is clear. We've got to close this gap. Uh, that means we have to create change. In other words, if we don't change things, we will not close the gap. We will stay on the baseline. Now, if you look at these documents, almost all of them have to do with how to close the gap. Very little discussion of what's in the baseline and why we should privilege that, why would we should assume that that baseline is what would happen if we don't take all these actions. But the baseline is changing. I think this is a fundamental point that gets way too little attention in the energy literature and the climate change literature, is the fundamental transformations that are happening all around us as we speak in every single aspect of life. Religion, culture, technology, society, politics, economics, it's all changing. This is just one report, the European Commission on Lifestyles, uh, and so it focuses on the kind of end use, uh, the, the, the individual, uh, the culture of producing and sharing, augmented and programmed lives, resilient and proactive citizens, which we just saw an example of, uh, and the quest for purpose. All of these things in turn are connected to very large changes that are happening in all the systems uh, in which we exist. Uh, there's, of course, this huge literature on megatrends, um, uh, and i just give you one example here from, a, from a, actually a consulting firm, but there's tons of material about what things are changing under our feet. The point to be made here, I think, is that these things are happening. Change, rapid transformative change is all around us. We are immersed in transformation, and yet not all of it is in the direction we would want to go. That's the point about it. Uh, is that uh, we can have rapid transformative change in very unsustainable directions. And uh, what Jenny just put up, the, the distinction between uh, the official American energy policy and this alternative way of thinking are examples. Both of those are possible. There's no guarantee we'll end up with a sustainable one. Um, uh, so we have rapid transformative change, unavoidable. Transformation is not avoidable. We don't have a non trans formative future. There is no business as usual. There isn't even a current trends. So almost all the baselines that are assumed in almost all the studies are deeply dubious. This is, of course, the fundamental lesson of scenarios literature pioneered by Shell back in the early 70s is the concept often ignored in people in studies that use the term scenario. They're not actually doing scenario analysis. The fundamental concept of scenario analysis, of course, is multiple incommensurable baselines. And that's what we have. Transform we don't have an option of a non-transformative future. We have options of what that transformative future will look like. 
give you an example uh, from the energy field, climate change field. This is some work that Arnef Grubler and his colleagues have done at Yass and elsewhere, uh, published in Nature Energy last November. And they are talking about energy, but they don't start with energy. They start with the kinds of things that are happening, the kind of changes I've been talking about. So in the outer ring there, you see uh, five areas where fundamental change is happening uh, across the world in various ways. And then on the inner circle is these additional, these additional elements uh, that uh, feed off the outer five and are starting to change the very texture of, of our lives. Their argument is that if you actually pay attention not to energy policy measures like renewable energy and energy efficiency, you start paying attention to the activities that underlie that, uh, you can end up with quite plausible what they call a low energy demand scenario that is achieved without all of the massive contortions required in the other three SSP scenarios from the IPCC. If you see the shaded lines on those other three in the yellow, that's uh, carbon capture and storage, bio bioenergy carbon capture and storage. These are big intrusive <laughs> uh, uh, interventions. Um, their argument is uh, don't focus on the energy system to make changes in energy. Focus on the activities underneath that. So the lesson here, I think, is there is no single baseline. As I said, this is the key uh, lesson of scenario analysis itself. Transformational changes in key aspects of our world are already occurring um, and will continue. So the issue is not about creating change. The issue is about steering change, maybe tilting the playing field, to use Frank's term. Um, the, the, it's going on. We're immersed in it. We're surrounded by change, but it may not be sustainable. It may not take us in sustainable directions. How do we tilt the playing field? How do we steer that change? That's a completely different agenda than saying we're locked into immobility and we have to create change. It takes you in a different direction. You look for different uh, outcomes, not just outcomes, but actions. That's the first point. The second point has to do with pathways, and here I want to turn to a work that's going on in, in IPCC. These are different uh, emission scenarios. And notice the underlined word at the top. These are baseline scenarios. These are the famous socio, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways that are the basis of, of, of the new generation of SSP work, or sorry, IPCC work. Um, and uh, what baseline means in this context is there's no climate policy in any of these scenarios. These are emission scenarios without any more climate policy than already exists as of the current day. That's crucial because what we see is our current emissions, uh, the baseline for the scenario is under 40, we're now about 42, as we heard yesterday, uh, gigatons of carbon per year. They could be three times higher at the end of the century or lower than today without any climate policy. Let me repeat that, without any climate policy. We could have emissions three times as high as today or lower than today. How could that be? Because it depends on which of these shared socioeconomic pathways we're in. These shared socioeconomic pathways have very different assumptions about how things unfold. They are different scenarios of the future world. What does that tell us? That tells us that the choice of pathway is more important than the choice of climate policy to achieve our climate goals. The world we're in, if we're in one of those, uh, say the fossil fuel development world, um, or, or in the inequality world, we're, we, are we are in a process with inherently high energy demands. Um, uh, so we need to think about what will take us onto a different general pathway, not just what energy policy and climate policy we need. What is a path pathway anyway? This is how we defined it in the uh, th third assessment, uh, sorry, the fourth assessment report in the sustainable development chapter of IPCC as a complex array of technological, economic, social, institutional, cultural, and biophysical characteristics that determine the interaction between human and natural systems, including consumption and production patterns over time at a particular scale. The classic academic definition, a little hard to operationalize. <laughs> if we try and attach some transition thinking to it and also the multi-level governance uh, literature to it, then we start to find something that becomes a little more uh, tractable. So operating at the scale of socio-technical systems and systems of governance 
uh, and the interplay between them. We just heard uh, a presentation on that uh, a minute ago. Um, the development path itself is emergent. Uh, it isn't usually planned. There's no one saying, here's the global development path and we're going to rule it from somewhere. Um, no, it emerges from a whole suite of decisions made at multiple levels. It inter exhibits interlinking regime rules and behaviors and reinforces at multiple levels. This is very standard for, for this audience way of thinking about a development path. Um, and that leads to the kind of conclusion you see in much of the literature. We're not talking about technologies changing, but constellations of actors, governance approaches and values, social learning and experimentation are crucial drivers as are pressures from external systems. I'm just really repeating uh, things you know very well in this room. Uh, since the process is complex and emergent, we need multi-stakeholder engagement. But I want to focus a little bit on one aspect of this approach to development paths, which is the aspect of institutional embedding. Uh, how do these different ways of approaching things at these multiple levels get embedded in the rule systems that govern what people do on Monday morning? Um, and basically, my argument here is we can focus our attention on policy, and having good policy is a good thing, but it's radically insufficient. If we don't dig deeper into the institutional guts and start looking at job descriptions, performance evaluation criteria, codes of practice, regulatory and professional standards, the rules that actually determine what everybody does on Monday morning, that's what has to change um, if the institution is going to be taking a different route. Uh, than it has in the past. So policy is important, but policy doesn't get you there if you don't get down into the institutional guts. Um, this, of course, then leads to the arguments about uh, creating experimentation, and, uh, because we just don't know the answers. That's why the shift of locus, the locus of agency on climate change has really shifted from the international sphere down to the municipal level. This is really noticeable in the last 15 years. That all the energy is now at the city level, and that's good because there are thousands of cities, and there's only uh, 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 hundreds of countries, 172, whatever the number is. Uh, so we can get a lot more experimentation done at the municipal level, and we need a lot because we need to try out a lot of different things. We don't have all the answers. Uh, in our work in British Columbia, we looked at 172 municipalities. We found that alignment was a crucial factor in the ability of municipalities to, to take action. So to conclude then on the pathways point, the pathway we're on is more important than what climate policies we choose. Development paths, thinking of development paths may be a useful way to approach this question of steering change, tilting uh, change. Uh, are tilting the system, um, uh, and I think a key question is this question of institutional embedment, embedding. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about intervention. We're trying to intervene, we're trying to make a better world. What's the process of intervention? A very common way of thinking about intervention, which Jenny also referred to, is this idea of what we might call persuasive communication. And that is that we know the story, we're the experts, we do the analysis, and the rest of the world doesn't understand, and they need to know. So we have to somehow replace the wrong story in our audiences, whether they're policymakers or the public, uh, with the right story that we have in hand. The focus of this kind of approach is on conscious individual behavior change. So we're educating people so that they will understand. The premise is that people are resistant to change uh, but can be convinced. And it's based on what's been called an information deficit model uh, of behavior change which says if you provide information that can change beliefs or attitudes, sometimes values are part of the chain, uh, which will change intentions and which will in turn change behaviors. When we know actually that often it works exactly the other way around. We bring our intentions in line with our behaviors and we bring our beliefs in line with those intentions and behaviors. Um, and there's literature in multiple fields that show this reverse causality, that show that the information deficit model simply doesn't work. It doesn't change behavior. The best evidence that the information deficit model doesn't work, the best evidence that information doesn't change behavior, is we have 40 years of evidence that it doesn't change behavior and we keep using it over and over and over again. We, are, we illustrate exactly the failure of the information deficit model in our attempt to educate the world about uh, the need to do what we think is important. So if this doesn't work, 
what, do, what does work? This has led to a whole bunch of literature in the social practice realm uh, under the label of beyond behavior change. If we move from a behavior change based approach which focuses on individual conscious choice, maybe it's useful to think in terms of social practices which are not typically conscious and which are not typically individual, in fact, which are not individual. Um, and this is the standard sort of Chauvian social practice um, uh, uh, framework. We have materials, we have meanings, and we have competences, and they interact in a way that we carry the social practice of brushing our teeth, uh, or the social practice of bicycling in Copenhagen, or whatever it might be. There's a theoretical spectrum here, it's a really interesting one, about the locus of agency, which ranges across disciplines. Are we talking about individual conscious chosen behavior or collective unconscious carried practices? These tend to nest themselves in different uh, parts of the disciplinary spectrum, uh, as suggested here. I want to just give you one example, because uh, that's a little abstract, uh, what I've been saying about that. And this is a building we built at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver called the uh, SIRS, the Center for Interactive Research on Sustainability. Uh, SIRS was designed to be net positive, not net zero. Net positive in four environmental ways, energy, uh, um, operational carbon, structural carbon, water quality, and three human ways, health, productivity, and happiness. So was, the building is designed to make you happier and healthier and more productive, and to be net po make the environment better, not just less bad. Um, so I'm not going to talk to you about the environmental performance, but I want to say just a word about uh, some work that Sylvia Coleman did uh, on, on this idea of normalizing sustainability in the building. Can the building help you become an, an inhabitant instead of an occupant, instead of a passive recipient of building systems actually engaged with your building actively? And can that, <coughs> excuse me, produce net positive outcomes from a sort of practice point of view? She, her dissertation is done. We've published some uh, initial work on that. Here are her, her conclusions that we do have a building in this case that does enable this transition from passive occupants to active inhabitants. It is perceived incredibly positive post-occupancy evaluation outcomes. People love the building. They love being in the building. They feel more healthy and they feel more productive. Normalizing sustainability through practices in this kind of thing can be done. So that's just one example. There's lots of other examples of social practice type approaches being applied. The general argument here is as long as unsustainability is the default, as long as the baseline is assumed to be unsustainable and we have to torque people away from it, we have to create change, we're failing because it means the default is unsustainable and we see a big persistence problem in behavior change programs. People snap back after a certain amount of time to tr their conventional behavior. As long as unsustainability is the default, we are losing. In fact, we're not just losing, we're failing. Uh, we have to somehow make sustainability to the default. So you would have to torque people away from sustainability. They will snap back to sustainability. That's the goal of normalization that I think uh, we're looking for. So in summary of these three points, we need to steer change, not create it. That's a different agenda. At the level of the underlying development paths, not just policies and technologies, in order to normalize sustainability, make it the default, not the change. I want to end by raising a, a little deeper issue, what I think is a deeper issue. This is a paper that a colleague of mine have written um, where we argue that uh, the beginning of the Anthropocene marks the end of the Holocene from a geological point of view, which was a time of great planetary stability. But conceptually, maybe the Anthropocene marks the end of the modernist period, a time of great epistemic stability. We've had three or four hundred years of thinking we knew how to understand the world. Uh, and that um, modern science and technology, tell, science tells us true things about the real world, and that's the way we get our answers to all of the problems that face us. Uh, this is not typical of any other culture at any other time of human history, but it's a very typical pattern over the last 400 years in the Western world initially, and, and then spreads beyond. What if that's also in question? What if this whole modernist understanding of the way the world works is in question. I think this takes us beyond transition or even transformation. 
And I, it might be useful to think of Ulrich Beck's last work, his posthumously published book, on metamorphosis. Um, Beck says metamorphosis of the world is happening all around us. It's already here. It's not something we're going to create. We are metamorphosing. Uh, and for Beck, metamorphosis is radical reformulation of our underlying views of the world. A twist we would add is it's not just epistemological. This is actually an ontological shift, potentially, as well. What's changing under our feet is not just our world views, our perceptions of that world, but the world itself. Um, and so maybe there's a question of ontological agency, the ability to change the world underneath us. We're focusing on the role of art in this context. Um, but I want to end with a, a three-step process of metamorphic change that might connect in some ways to the transition and transformation theory ideas. The first step is crystallization. Our activities necessarily crystallize uh, and better they, the better we, uh, they, they represent, the better they crystallize uh, the culture around us. When Bill Bow appears on the scene or the Chicago World's Fair of 1890, they crystallize the whole cultural context at that time. Um, and so our activities, we are effects. We're not, just, we're not causes fundamentally. We are effects of a whole suite of processes that gave rise to our arguments about sustainability, our views about what kind of world we need to have. I think it's useful to think of ourselves in that way. Um, but crystallization isn't enough because that just codifies what is. We need some emergence. Uh, and here the concept of hopeful monster that you might be familiar with from uh, evolutionary biology I think is a really interesting concept. It's a term, by the way, coined one year after the new synthesis of Julian Huxley in uh, evolutionary theory and has been scorned for decades ever since. But now in the last 10 years is re-emerging in, in evolutionary biology. Um, and this is the idea of macro mutation that you can have large-scale system change, which was not allowed under the neo-Darwinian synthesis, but now, as I said, is re-emerging. Um, and so Bilbao and the Chicago World's Fair, there's something new there. They're, they're not just crystallizing. They're not just distilling what exists. There's actually something new there that has a huge impact. So the third part is resonance. Can we see these cultural shifts happening at this cultural scale, having resonance and spreading very rapidly through the culture? So I'll end with the uh, question, is sustainability itself a hopeful monster? Thanks very much.